George Washington Carver, Wikipedia Audio George Washington Carver January 5, 1943, was an American botanist and inventor. He actively promoted alternative crops to cotton and methods to prevent soil depletion. While a professor at Tuskegee Institute, Carver developed techniques to improve soils depleted by repeated plantings of cotton. He wanted poor farmers to grow alternative crops, such as peanuts and sweet potatoes, as a source of their own food and to improve their quality of life. The most popular of his 44 practical bulletins for farmers contained 105 food recipes using peanuts. Although he spent years developing and promoting numerous products made from peanuts, none became commercially successful. Apart from his work to improve the lives of farmers, Carver was also a leader in promoting environmentalism. He received numerous honors for his work, including the Spingarn Medal of the NAACP. In an era of very high racial polarization, his fame reached beyond the black community. He was widely recognized and praised in the white community for his many achievements and talents. In 1941, Time magazine dubbed Carver a Black Leonardo. Life George Washington Carver was born into slavery in Diamond Grove, Newton County, near Crystal Place, now known as Diamond, Missouri, sometime in the early mid-1860s. The exact date of his birth is uncertain and was not known to Carver however it was some time before slavery was abolished in Missouri in January 1865. His master, Moses Carver, was a German-American immigrant who had purchased George's parents, Mary and Giles, from William P. McGinnis on October 9, 1855, for $700. When George was only a week old, he, a sister, and his mother were kidnapped by night raiders from Arkansas. George's brother, James, was rushed to safety from the kidnappers. The kidnappers sold the slaves in Kentucky. Moses Carver hired John Bentley to find them, but he located only the infant George. Moses negotiated with the raiders to gain the boy's return, and rewarded Bentley. After slavery was abolished, Moses Carver and his wife Susan raised George and his older brother James as their own children. They encouraged George to continue his intellectual pursuits, and Aunt Susan taught him the basics of reading and writing. Black people were not allowed at the public school in Diamond Grove. George decided to go to a school for black children ten miles south in Neosho. When he reached the town, he found the school closed for the night. He slept in a nearby barn. By his own account, the next morning he met a kind woman, Mariah Watkins, from whom he wished to rent a room. When he identified himself as Carver's George, as he had done his whole life, she replied that from now on his name was George Carver. George liked Mariah Watkins, and her words, You must learn all you can, then go back out into the world and give your learning back to the people, made a great impression on him. At the age of 13, due to his desire to attend the academy there, he relocated to the home of another foster family in Fort Scott, Kansas. After witnessing a black man killed by a group of whites, Carver left the city. He attended a series of schools before earning his diploma at Minneapolis High School in Minneapolis, Kansas. Carver applied to several colleges before being accepted at Highland University in Highland, Kansas. When he arrived, however, they rejected him because of his race. In August 1886, Carver traveled by wagon with J.F. Beeler from Highland to Eden Township in Ness County, 
Kansas. He homesteaded a claim near Beeler, where he maintained a small conservatory of plants and flowers and a geological collection. He manually plowed 17 acres of the claim, planting rice, corn, Indian corn, and garden produce, as well as various fruit trees, forest trees, and shrubbery. He also earned money by odd jobs in town and worked as a ranch hand. In early 1888, Carver obtained a $300 loan at the Bank of Ness City for education. By June he left the area. In 1890, Carver started studying art and piano at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. His art teacher, Etta Budd, recognized Carver's talent for painting flowers and plants, she encouraged him to study botany at Iowa State Agricultural College in Ames. When he began there in 1891, he was the first black student. Carver's bachelor's thesis was Plants as Modified by Man, dated 1894. Iowa State professors Joseph Budd and Lewis Pamel convinced Carver to continue there for his master's degree. Carver did research at the Iowa Experiment Station under Pamel during the next two years. His work at the Experiment Station in Plant Pathology and Mycology first gained him national recognition and respect as a botanist. Carver taught as the first black faculty member at Iowa State. In 1896, Booker T. Washington, the first principal and president of the Tuskegee Institute, invited Carver to head its agriculture department. Carver taught there for 47 years, developing the department into a strong research center and working with two additional college presidents during his tenure. He taught methods of crop rotation, introduced several alternative cash crops for farmers that would also improve the soil of areas heavily cultivated in cotton, initiated research into crop products, and taught generations of black students farming techniques for self-sufficiency. Carver designed a mobile classroom to take education out to farmers. He called it a Jessup wagon after the New York financier and philanthropist Morris Ketchum Jessup, who provided funding to support the program. Early Years To recruit Carver to Tuskegee, Washington gave him an above-average salary and two rooms for his personal use, although both concessions were resented by some other faculty. Because he had earned a master's in a scientific field from a white institution, some faculty perceived him as arrogant. Unmarried faculty members normally had to share rooms, with two to a room, in the Spartan early days of the institute. One of Carver's duties was to administer the agricultural experiment station farms. He had to manage the production and sale of farm products to generate revenue for the institute. He soon proved to be a poor administrator. In 1900, Carver complained that the physical work and the letter writing required were too much. In 1904, an institute committee reported that Carver's reports on yields from the poultry yard were exaggerated and Washington confronted Carver about the issue. Carver replied in writing, Now to be branded as a liar and party to such hellish deception it is more than I can bear, and if your committee feel that I have willfully lied or party to such lies as were told my resignation is at your disposal. During Washington's last five years at Tuskegee, Carver submitted or threatened his resignation several times when the administration reorganized the agriculture programs, when he disliked a teaching assignment, to manage an experiment station elsewhere, and when he did not get summer teaching assignments in 1913-14. In each case, Washington smoothed things over. Carver started his academic career as a researcher and teacher. 
In 1911, Washington wrote a letter to him complaining that Carver had not followed orders to plant particular crops at the experiment station. This revealed Washington's micromanagement of Carver's department, which he had headed for more than ten years by then. Washington at the same time refused Carver's requests for a new laboratory, research supplies for his exclusive use, and respite from teaching classes. Washington praised Carver's abilities in teaching and original research but said about his administrative skills. When it comes to the organization of classes, the ability required to secure a properly organized and large school or section of a school, you are wanting an ability. When it comes to the matter of practical farm managing which will secure definite, practical, financial results, you are wanting again an ability. In 1911, Carver complained that his laboratory had not received the equipment which Washington had promised 11 months before. He also complained about institute committee meetings. Washington praised Carver in his 1911 memoir, My Larger Education, being chapters from my experience. Washington called Carver one of the most thoroughly scientific men of the Negro race with whom I am acquainted. After Washington died in 1915, his successor made fewer demands on Carver for administrative tasks. While a professor at Tuskegee, Carver joined the Gamma Sigma chapter of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. He spoke at the 1930 conclave that was held at Tuskegee, Alabama, in which he delivered a powerful and emotional speech to the men in attendance. From 1915 to 1923, Carver concentrated on researching and experimenting with new uses for peanuts, sweet potatoes, soybeans, pecans, and other crops, as well as having his assistants research and compile existing uses. This work, and especially his speaking to a national conference of the Peanut Growers Association in 1920 and in testimony before Congress in 1921 to support passage of a tariff on imported peanuts, brought him wide publicity and increasing renown. In these years, he became one of the most well-known African Americans of his time. College Tuskegee Institute Carver developed techniques to improve soils depleted by repeated plantings of cotton. Together with other agricultural experts, he urged farmers to restore nitrogen to their soils by practicing systematic crop rotation, alternating cotton crops with plantings of sweet potatoes or legumes. These crops both restored nitrogen to the soil and were good for human consumption. Following the crop rotation practice resulted in improved cotton yields and gave farmers alternative cash crops. To train farmers to successfully rotate and cultivate the new crops, Carver developed an agricultural extension program for Alabama that was similar to the one at Iowa State. To encourage better nutrition in the South, he widely distributed recipes using the alternative crops. Rise to Fame Life While Famous Relationships Death Voice Pitch In addition, he founded an industrial research laboratory, where he and assistants worked to popularize the new crops by developing hundreds of applications for them. They did original research as well as promoting applications and recipes which they collected from others. Carver distributed his information as agricultural bulletins. Carver's work was known by officials in the national capital before he became a public figure. President Theodore Roosevelt publicly admired his work. Former professors of Carver's from Iowa State University were appointed to positions as Secretary of Agriculture, James Wilson, a former dean and professor of Carver's, 
served from 1897 to 1913. Henry Cantwell Wallace served from 1921 to 1924. He knew Carver personally because his son Henry A. Wallace and the researcher were friends. The younger Wallace served as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from 1933 to 1940, and as Franklin Delano Roosevelt S. Vice President from 1941 to 1945. The American industrialist, farmer, and inventor William Edenborn of Wynn Parish, Louisiana, grew peanuts on his demonstration farm. He consulted with Carver. Christianity In 1916, Carver was made a member of the Royal Society of Arts in England, one of only a handful of Americans at that time to receive this honor. Carver's promotion of peanuts gained him the most notice. In 1919, Carver wrote to a peanut company about the potential he saw for peanut milk. Both he and the peanut industry seemed unaware that in 1917 William Melhuish had secured U.S. 1243855, issued October 23, 1917 for a milk substitute made from peanuts and soybeans. The United Peanut Associations of America invited Carver to speak at their 1920 convention. He discussed the possibilities of the peanut and exhibited 145 peanut products. By 1920, the U.S. peanut farmers were being undercut by low prices on imported peanuts from the Republic of China. In 1921, Peanut farmers and industry representatives planned to appear at congressional hearings to ask for a tariff. Based on the quality of Carver's presentation at their convention, they asked the African-American professor to testify on the tariff issue before the Ways and Means Committee of the United States House of Representatives. Due to segregation, it was highly unusual for an African American to appear as an expert witness at Congress representing European American industry and farmers. Southern congressmen, reportedly shocked at Carver's arriving to testify, were said to have mocked him. As he talked about the importance of the peanut and its uses for American agriculture, the committee members repeatedly extended the time for his testimony. The Fortney McCumber Tariff of 1922 was passed including one on imported peanuts. Carver's testifying to Congress made him widely known as a public figure. During the last two decades of his life, Carver seemed to enjoy his celebrity status. He was often on the road promoting Tuskegee University, peanuts, and racial harmony. Although he only published six agricultural bulletins after 1922, he published articles in peanut industry journals and wrote a syndicated newspaper column, Professor Carver's Advice. Business leaders came to seek his help, and he often responded with free advice. Three American presidents Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, and Franklin Roosevelt met with him and the Crown Prince of Sweden studied with him for three weeks. From 1923 to 1933, Carver toured white southern colleges for the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. With his increasing notability, Carver became the subject of biographies and articles. Raleigh H. Merritt contacted him for his biography published in 1929. Merritt wrote, at present not a great deal has been done to utilize Dr. Carver's discoveries commercially. He says that he is merely scratching the surface of scientific investigations of the possibilities of the peanut and other southern products. In 1932, the writer James Saxon Childers wrote that Carver and his peanut products were almost solely responsible for the rise in U.S. peanut production after the boll weevil devastated the American cotton crop beginning about 1892. 
His article, A Boy Who Was Traded for a Horse, in the American Magazine, and its 1937 reprint in Reader's Digest, contributed to this myth about Carver's influence. Other popular media tended to exaggerate Carver's impact on the peanut industry. Honors From 1933 to 1935, Carver worked to develop peanut oil massages to treat infantile paralysis. Ultimately, researchers found that the massages, not the peanut oil, provided the benefits of maintaining some mobility to paralyzed limbs. From 1935 to 1937, Carver participated in the USDA Disease Survey. Carver had specialized in plant diseases and mycology for his master's degree. Legacy In 1937, Carver attended two Kemergy conferences, an emerging field in the 1930s, during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, concerned with developing new products from crops. He was invited by Henry Ford to speak at the conference held in Dearborn, Michigan, and they developed a friendship. That year Carver's health declined, and Ford later installed an elevator at the Tuskegee dormitory where Carver lived, so that the elderly man would not have to climb stairs. Carver had been frugal in his life and in his 70s he established a legacy by creating a museum of his work, as well as the George Washington Carver Foundation at Tuskegee in 1938 to continue agricultural research. He donated nearly US$60,000 in his savings to create the foundation. Reputed Inventions Peanut Products Sweet Potato Products Carver never married. At age 40, he began a courtship with Sarah L. Hunt, an elementary school teacher and the sister-in-law of Warren Logan, treasurer of Tuskegee Institute. This lasted three years until she took a teaching job in California. In her 2015 biography, Christina Vela reviews his relationships and suggests that Carver was bisexual and constrained by mores of his historic period. When he was 70, Carver established a friendship and research partnership with the scientist Austin W. Curtis, J.R. This young black man, a graduate of Cornell University, had some teaching experience before coming to Tuskegee. Carver bequeathed to Curtis his royalties from an authorized 1943 biography by Rackham Holt. After Carver died in 1943, Curtis was fired from Tuskegee Institute. He left Alabama and resettled in Detroit. There he manufactured and sold peanut-based personal care products. Upon returning home one day, Carver took a bad fall down a flight of stairs, he was found unconscious by a maid who took him to a hospital. Carver died January 5, 1943, at the age of 78 from complications resulting from this fall. He was buried next to Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee University. Due to his frugality, Carver's life savings totaled $60,000 all of which he donated in his last years and at his death to the Carver Museum and to the George Washington Carver Foundation. On his grave was written, he could have added fortune to fame, but caring for neither, he found happiness and honor in being helpful to the world. Even as an adult Carver spoke with a high pitch. Historian Linda O. McMurray noted that he was a frail and sickly child who suffered from a severe case of whooping cough and frequent bouts of what was called croup. McMurray contested the diagnosis of croup, holding rather that his stunted growth and apparently impaired vocal cords suggest instead tubercular or pneumococcal infection. 
frequent infections of that nature could have caused the growth of polyps on the larynx and may have resulted from a gamma globulin deficiency, until his death the high pitch of his voice startled all who met him, and he suffered from frequent chest congestion and loss of voice. McMurray also examined the theory that Carver's vocal pitch was due to being castrated as a child. She noted that persistent rumors held he was castrated either by his kidnappers or his owner Moses Carver. She maintained these accounts were unlikely as a person castrated before puberty almost never displays any secondary sexual characteristics and seldom grows to normal stature. While Carver's voice never deepened, he reached normal height and grew facial hair. She also pointed out that it was extremely unlikely that Carver would have maintained affection for Moses if he had castrated him, but he retained obvious affection for Moses, after he left Diamond he returned on several occasions to visit the Carvers, even after Susan's death. McMurray admitted that the castration theory can't be dismissed entirely. She pointed to Carver's reply in 1937 to a friend's question on why he never married, he had replied obliquely to a tragic incident in his past that precluded him from marriage. McMurray further noted he was also very reluctant to discuss the years between his departure from Diamond and his arrival at Iowa State often declaring that there were some things that he would rather forget. McMurray pointed out that after puberty, castration or testicular failure due to accident or illness would not prevent the development of secondary sexual characteristics. She also pointed out that Carver's failure to marry was not proof of castration, as it can be explained in other ways. Carver believed he could have faith both in God and science and integrated them into his life. He testified on many occasions that his faith in Jesus was the only mechanism by which he could effectively pursue and perform the art of science. Carver became a Christian when he was still a young boy, as he wrote in connection to his conversion in 1931. I was just a mere boy when converted hardly ten years old. There isn't much of a story to it. God just came into my heart one afternoon while I was alone in the loft of our big barn while I was shelling corn to carry to the mill to be ground into meal, a dear little white boy, one of our neighbors, about my age came by one Saturday morning, and in talking and playing he told me he was going to Sunday school tomorrow morning. I was eager to know what a Sunday school was. He said they sang hymns and prayed. I asked him what prayer was and what they said. I do not remember what he said, only remember that as soon as he left I climbed up into the loft, knelt down by the barrel of corn and prayed as best I could. I do not remember what I said. I only recall that I felt so good that I prayed several times before I quit, my brother and myself were the only colored children in that neighborhood and of course, we could not go to church or Sunday school, or school of any kind, that was my simple conversion, and I have tried to keep the faith. He was not expected to live past his 21st birthday due to failing health. He lived well past the age of 21, and his belief deepened as a result. Throughout his career, he always found friendship with other Christians. He relied on them especially when criticized by the scientific community and media regarding his research methodology. Carver viewed faith in Jesus Christ as a means of destroying both barriers of racial disharmony and social stratification. He was as concerned with his students' character development as he was with their intellectual development. He compiled a list of eight cardinal virtues for his students to strive toward. Beginning in 1906 at Tuskegee, Carver led a Bible class on Sundays for several students at their request. He regularly portrayed stories by acting them out. He responded to critics with this 
when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. A movement to establish a U.S. national monument to Carver began before his death. Because of World War II, such non-war expenditures had been banned by presidential order. Missouri Senator Harry S. Truman sponsored a bill in favor of a monument. In a committee hearing on the bill, one supporter said, The bill is not simply a momentary pause on the part of busy men engaged in the conduct of the war, to do honor to one of the truly great Americans of this country, but it is in essence a blow against the Axis, it is in essence a war measure in the sense that it will further unleash and release the energies of roughly 15 million Negro people in this country for full support of our war effort. The bill passed unanimously in both houses. On July 14, 1943, President Franklin D. Roosevelt dedicated $30,000 for the George Washington Carver National Monument west-southwest of Diamond, Missouri, the area where Carver had spent time in his childhood. This was the first national monument dedicated to an African American and the first to honor someone other than a president. The two 10-acre national monument complex includes a bust of Carver, a three-fourth mile nature trail, a museum, the 1881 Moses Carver House, and the Carver Cemetery. The National Monument opened in July 1953. In December 1947, a fire broke out in the Carver Museum, and much of the collection was damaged. Time magazine reported that all but three of the 48 Carver paintings at the museum were destroyed. His best-known painting, displayed at the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago, depicts a yucca and cactus. This canvas survived and has undergone conservation. It is displayed together with several of his other paintings. Carver was featured on U.S. 1948 commemorative stamps. From 1951 to 1954, he was depicted on a commemorative half-dollar coin. A second stamp honoring Carver, of face value 32 cents, was issued on February 3, 1998 as part of the Celebrate the Century stamp sheet series. Two ships the Liberty ship SS George Washington Carver and the nuclear submarine USS George Washington Carver, were named in his honor. In 1977, Carver was elected to the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. In 1990, Carver was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. In 1994, Iowa State University awarded Carver a Doctor of Humane Letters. In 2000, Carver was a charter inductee in the USDA Hall of Heroes as the father of Kemmergy. In 2002, scholar Molify Keat Asante listed George Washington Carver as one of 100 greatest African Americans. In 2005, Carver's research at the Tuskegee Institute was designated a National Historic Chemical Landmark by the American Chemical Society. On February 15, 2005, an episode of Modern Marvels included scenes from within Iowa State University's Food Sciences Building and about Carver's work. In 2005, the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis Missouri, opened a George Washington Carver Garden in his honor, which includes a life-size statue of him. Many institutions continue to honor George Washington Carver. A garden and statue of him are dedicated in the noted Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis. Dozens of elementary schools and high schools are named after him. National Basketball Association star David Robinson and his wife, Valerie, founded an academy named after Carver, 
It opened on September 17, 2001, in San Antonio, Texas. The Carver Community Cultural Center, a historic center located in San Antonio, is named for him. Carver was given credit in popular folklore for many inventions that did not come out of his lab. Three patents were issued to Carver in 1925-1927, however, they were not commercially successful. Aside from these patents and some recipes for food, Carver left no records of formulae or procedures for making his products. He did not keep a laboratory notebook. Macintosh notes that, Carver did not explicitly claim that he had personally discovered all the peanut attributes and uses he cited, but he said nothing to prevent his audiences from drawing the inference. Carver's research was intended to produce replacements from common crops for commercial products, which were generally beyond the budget of the small one-horse farmer. A misconception grew that his research on products for subsistence farmers were developed by others commercially to change southern agriculture. Carver's work to provide small farmers with resources for more independence from the cash economy foreshadowed the appropriate technology work of E. F. Schumacher. Dennis Keeney, director of the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture at Iowa State University, wrote in the Leopold letter. Carver worked on improving soils, growing crops with low inputs, and using species that fixed nitrogen. Carver wrote in The Need of Scientific Agriculture in the South, the virgin fertility of our soils and the vast amount of unskilled labor have been more of a curse than a blessing to agriculture. This exhaustive system for cultivation, the destruction of forest, the rapid and almost constant decomposition of organic matter, have made our agricultural problem one requiring more brains than of the North, East, or West. Carver worked for years to create a company to market his products. The most important was the Carver Penal Company, which sold a mixture of creosote and peanuts as a patent medicine for respiratory diseases such as tuberculosis. Sales were lackluster and the product was ineffective according to the Food and Drug Administration. Other ventures were the Carver Products Company and the Carvaline Company. Carvaline antiseptic hair dressing was a mix of peanut oil and lanolin. Carvaline rubbing oil was a peanut oil for massages. Carver is often mistakenly credited with the invention of peanut butter. By the time Carver published How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing it for Human Consumption in 1916, many methods of preparation of peanut butter had been developed or patented by various pharmacists, doctors, and food scientists working in the U.S. and Canada. The Aztec were known to have made peanut butter from ground peanuts as early as the 15th century. Canadian pharmacist Marcellus Gilmore Edson was awarded U.S. Patent 306,727 in 1884, 12 years before Carver began his work at Tuskegee. Carver is also associated with developing sweet potato products. In his 1922 Sweet Potato Bulletin, Carver listed a few dozen recipes, many of which I have copied verbatim from Bulletin No. 129, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Carver's records included the following sweet potato products, 73 dyes, 17 wood fillers, 14 candies, 5 library pastes, 5 breakfast foods, 4 starches, 4 flours, and 3 molasses. He also had listings for vinegars, dry coffee, and instant coffee, candy, after-dinner mints, orange drops, and lemon drops. During his more than four decades at Tuskegee, 
Carver's official published work consisted mainly of 44 practical bulletins for farmers. His first bulletin in 1898 was on feeding acorns to farm animals. His final bulletin in 1943 was about the peanut. He also published six bulletins on sweet potatoes, five on cotton, and four on cow peas. Some other individual bulletins dealt with alfalfa, wild plum, tomato, ornamental plants, corn, poultry, dairying, hogs, preserving meats in hot weather, and nature study in schools. His most popular bulletin, How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing it for Human Consumption, was first published in 1916 and was reprinted many times. It gave a short overview of peanut crop production and contained a list of recipes from other agricultural bulletins, cookbooks, magazines, and newspapers, such as the Peerless Cookbook, Good Housekeeping, and Berry's Fruit Recipes. Carver's was far from the first American agricultural bulletin devoted to peanuts, but his bulletins did seem to be more popular and widespread than previous ones. Carver Bulletins Notes Scholarly Studies Popular Works Archival Collections Other Print Publications <laughs>